Forty years ago this month, Noam Chomsky published Peace in the Middle East, Reflections on Justice and Nationhood. His 1983 book, The Fateful Triangle, The United States, Israel and the Palestinians, is known as one of the definitive works on the Israel-Palestine conflict. Professor Chomsky joins us from Boston. Welcome back to Democracy Now! Noam, uh, please first just comment, since we haven't spoken to you throughout um, the Israeli assault on Gaza, uh, your comments on what has just taken place. It's a hideous atrocity, a sadistic, vicious, uh, murderous, uh, totally illeg without any credible pretext. Uh, it's another one of the periodic Israeli exercises in what they delicately call mowing the lawn. Uh, that means uh, shooting fish in the pond. Uh, to make sure that the animals stay quiet in the cage that you've constructed for them, uh, after which you go to a period of what's called ceasefire, uh, which means that uh, Hamas observes the ceasefire as Israel concedes, while Israel continues to violate it. Uh, then it's broken by a, uh, an Israeli uh, escalation. Hamas reaction, then you have a period of mowing the lawn. This one is, in many ways, more uh, sadistic and vicious, uh, even than the earlier ones. And uh, what of the, the pretext that Israel used to launch these attacks? Uh, could you talk about that? The, uh, and what the, to what degree you feel it would had any validity? As uh, high Israeli officials concede, uh, Hamas had observed the previous ceasefire for 19 months. The previous episode of mowing the lawn was in November 2012. It was a ceasefire. Uh, the ceasefire uh, terms were that uh, Hamas would not fire rockets, what they call rockets, and Israel would uh, move to uh, end the blockade and stop uh, attacking uh, what they call militants in Gaza. Hamas lived up to it. Uh, Israel concedes that. Uh, uh, in uh, April of this year, an event took place which horrified the Israeli government. A unity agreement was formed between uh, Gaza and the West Bank, between Hamas and Fatah. Uh, Israel's been desperately trying to prevent that for a long time. There's a background we could talk about, but it's important. Anyhow, the unity agreement came. Israel was furious. Uh, they got even more uh, upset when the U.S. more or less endorsed it, uh, which is a big blow to them. They launched a rampage uh, in the West Bank. The, what was used as a pretext was the brutal murder of three uh, settler uh, teenagers. Uh, there was a pretense that uh, they were alive, that they knew they were dead. Uh, that allowed a, a huge, and of course they blamed it right away on Hamas. They have yet to produce a particle of evidence, and in fact their own highest uh, leading authorities uh, pointed out right, right away that the killers were probably from a kind of a rogue a, a clan in Hebron, the cosmic clan, which turns out apparently be true. They've been a thorn in the sides of Hamas for years. They don't follow their orders. But anyway, that gave a opportunity for a, a rampage in the West Bank, uh, arresting uh, hundreds of people, uh, re-arresting many who had been released, uh, mostly targeted on Hamas. Uh, killings increased. Uh, finally, there was a Hamas response, uh, the, the so-called rocket attacks, and that gave the opportunity for mowing the lawn again. You said that Israel does this periodically, Noam Chomsky. Um, why do they do this periodically? Because they want to maintain a certain situation. There's a background. Uh, for over 20 years, uh, Israel has been dedicated, with U.S. support, to separating Gaza from the West Bank. That's in direct violation of the uh, terms of the Oslo Accord 20 years ago. Uh, 
which uh, declared that uh, the West Bank and Gaza are a, uh, a single territorial entity whose integrity must be preserved. But for rogue states, uh, solemn agreements are just an invitation to do whatever you want. So Israel, with U.S. backing, has been c committed to keeping them separate. And there's a good reason for that. Just look at the map. Uh, if uh, Gaza is the only outlet to the outside world for any eventual Palestinian entity, whatever it might be, uh, the West Bank, if separated from Gaza, the West Bank is essentially imprisoned. Uh, Israel on one side, the Jordanian dictatorship on the other. Uh, furthermore, Israel is systematically driving Palestinians out of the Jordan Valley, um, sinking wells, building settlements. They first call them military zones, then put in settlements, the usual story. Uh, that would mean that whatever cantons are left for Palestinians in the West Bank after Israel takes what it wants and integrates it into Israel, they would be completely imprisoned. Uh, Gaza would be an outlet to the outside world. So therefore, keeping them separate from one another is a uh, high a goal of policy, U.S. and Israeli policy. And the unity agreement uh, threatened that, uh, threatened something else. Israel has been claiming for years one of its uh, arguments for kind of evading negotiations is uh, how can they negotiate with the Palestinians when they're divided? Well, okay, so if they're not divided, you lose that argument. But the more significant one is simply the geostrategic one, uh, which is what I described. So the unity government was a real threat, along with the tepid but real endorsement of it by the United States, and they immediately reacted. And, and Noam, what do you make of the, of the, as you say, Israel seeks to maintain the status quo while at the same time continuing to create a new reality on the ground of expanded settlements? Uh, what do you make of the continued refusal of one administration after another here in the United States, which officially uh, is opposed to the settlement expansion, to refuse to call Israel to the table on this uh, attempt to create this its own reality on the ground? Well, your phrase, officially opposed, is quite correct. But we can look at, uh, you know, you have to distinguish the rhetoric of a government from its actions and the rhetoric of political leaders from their actions. That should be obvious. So we can see how committed the U.S. is to this policy easily. For example, in February 2011, uh, the U.N. Security Council uh, considered a resolution which called, for, which called on Israel to terminate its expansion of settlements Notice that it, the expansion of settlements is not really the issue. It's the settlements. Uh, the settlements, the infrastructure development, uh, all of this is in gross violation of international law that's been determined by the Security Council, the uh, International Court of Justice, uh, every, practically every country in the world outside of Israel uh, recognizes this. But this was a resolution calling for an end to expansion of settlements, official U.S. policy. What happened? Obama vetoed the resolution. Uh, that tells you something. Uh, furthermore, uh, the official uh, statements to Israel that, uh, about the settlement expansion is accompanied by what in diplomatic language is called a wink. Uh, and a, a quiet indication that we don't really mean it. Uh, so, for example, uh, Obama's latest uh, condemnation of the uh, recent, uh, uh, as he puts it, uh, violence on all sides was accompanied by sending more military aid to Israel. Well, they can understand that. And that's been true all along. In fact, uh, when Obama came into office, uh, he made the usual statements against settlement expansion. And his administration was, as spokespersons were asked in press conferences, whether Obama would do anything about it. 
the way the first George Bush did something, mild sanctions, uh, uh, to block settlement expansions. And the answer was, no, this is just symbolic. Well, that tells the Israeli government exactly what's happening. And in fact, if you look step by step, the military aid continues, the economic aid continues, the diplomatic protection continues, the ideological protection continues. By that I mean framing the issues in ways that conform to Israeli uh, demand. All of that continues, along with uh, kind of uh, clucking of the tongue, saying, well, we really don't like it, and it's not helpful to peace. Uh, any government can understand that. I want to turn to Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, who spoke to a foreign journalist yesterday. Israel accepted and Hamas rejected the Egyptian ceasefire proposal of July 15th. Now, I want you to know that at that time, the conflict had claimed some 185 lives. Only on Monday night did Hamas finally agree to that very same proposal, which went into effect yesterday morning. That means that 90 percent, a full 90 percent of the fatalities in this conflict could have been avoided had Hamas not rejected then the ceasefire that it accepts now. Hamas must be held accountable for the tragic loss of life. Noam Chomsky, can you respond to the Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu? A response and a broad response. The narrow response is that, of course, as Netanyahu knows, that ceasefire proposal was arranged between the Egyptian military dictatorship and Israel, both of them very hostile to Hamas. It was not even communicated to Hamas. They learned about it through social media, and they were angered by that, naturally. They said they won't accept it on those terms. Uh, that's the narrow response. The broad response is that 100 percent of the casualties and the destruction and the devastation and so on could have been avoided if Israel had lived up to the ceasefire agreement after uh, uh, the, uh, 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 in, from November 2012 instead of violating it constantly and then escalating the violation in the manner that I described. Uh, in order to block the unity government and to persist in their policy of uh, the, the policies of taking over what they want in the West Bank and uh, keeping ga separating it from Gaza and keeping Gaza on what they've called a diet of vice glasses, famous comment of the man who negotiated the so-called withdrawal in 2005 pointed out that uh, the pur purpose of the withdrawal is to uh, end the uh, discussion of any political settlement and to block any possibility of a Palestinian state. And meanwhile, the Gazans will be kept on a diet, meaning just enough calories allowed so they don't all die because that wouldn't look good for Israel's fading reputation, but nothing more than that. And with its uh, vaunted uh, technical capacity, uh, Israel, Israeli experts uh, calculated precisely how many calories would be needed to keep the Gazans on their diet, under siege, uh, blocked from export, uh, blocked from import. Uh, fishermen can't go out to fish. They, naval vessels driving back to shore, a uh, large part, probably over a third, maybe more, of Gaza's arable land is barred from entry to Palestinians. It's called a barrier. Uh, that's the norm. That's the diet. They want to keep them on that. Meanwhile, separated from the West Bank, and continue the ongoing project of taking over uh, can describe the details, but it's not obscure, taking over the parts of the West Bank that Israel intends is integrating into Israel and presumably will ultimately annex in some fashion. What's your assessment of the impact on the already abysmal relationship that exists between the United States government and the Arab and Muslim world? Well, first of all, we have to distinguish between 
the Muslim and Arab populations and their governments. Striking difference. The governments are mostly dictatorships. When you read in the press uh, that the Arabs uh, support us on so-and-so, what is meant is the dictators support us, not the populations. Uh, the dictatorships are, are moderately supportive of what the U.S. and Israel are doing. Uh, that includes the military dictatorship in Egypt, a very brutal one, uh, the Saudi Arabian dictatorship, or Saudi Arabia is the closest U.S. ally in the region, and uh, it's uh, the most radical uh, fundamentalist uh, Islamic state in the world. It's also uh, spreading its uh, Salafi Wahhabi doctrines throughout the world, uh, extremist fundamentalist doctrines. It's been the leading uh, ally of the United States uh, for years, just as it was for Britain before it. They've both tended to prefer radical Islam to the danger of secular nationalism and democracy. Uh, and uh, they uh, are fairly supportive of, uh, they don't like, they hate Hamas. Uh, they have no interest in the Palestinians. They have to say things to kind of uh, mollify their own populations. But again, rhetoric and action are different. So the, the dictatorships uh, are, are not appalled by what, what's happening. They probably um, are quietly cheering it. The populations, of course, are quite different, but that's always been true. Uh, so, for example, uh, uh, on the uh, eve of the Tahrir Square uh, demonstrations in Egypt, uh, which uh, overthrew the Mubarak dictatorship, there were international polls taken in the United States by the leading polling agencies, and they showed uh, very clearly that uh, I think about 80 percent of Egyptians regarded uh, the main threats to them as being Israel and the United States. A majority felt that the region might be safer if Iran had nuclear weapons. Uh, well, look over the whole polling story over the years, it kind of uh, varies around something like that. But that's the populations. I don't like it either. But it's not just the Muslim populations. So, for example, there was a demonstration in London recently, which probably had hundreds of thousands of people. It was quite a huge demonstration uh, protesting the uh, Israeli atrocities in Gaza. And that's happening elsewhere in the world, too. It's worth remembering that uh, if you go back a couple decades, uh, Israel was one of the most admired countries in the world. And now it's one of the most feared and despised countries in the world. Uh, Israeli propagandists like to say, well, this is just anti-Semitism. But there's a, to the extent that there's an anti-Semitic element, which is slight, it's because of Israeli actions. The reaction is to the policies. And, uh, and as long as Israel persists in these policies, that's what's going to happen. Actually, this has been pretty clear since the early 1970s. Actually, I've been writing about it since then, but it's so obvious that I don't take any credit for that. In 1971, uh, Israel made a fateful decision, uh, the most fateful in its history, I think. Uh, President Sadat of Egypt offered Israel a full peace treaty uh, in return for withdrawal of Israel from the Egyptian Sinai. Uh, that was the labor government, so-called moderate labor government at the time. Uh, they considered the offer and rejected it. Uh, they were planning to carry out extensive development programs in the Sinai, uh, build a huge, um, big city on the Mediterranean, uh, dozens of uh, uh, the settlements, kibbutzim, others, big infrastructure, uh, driving tens of thousands of Bedouins off the land, uh, destroying the villages and so on. Those were the plans, beginning to implement them. And Israel made a decision to choose expansion over security. And that's been the policy ever since. When you pursue a policy of repression and expansion uh, over security, you're certain there are things that are going to happen. 
Uh, there'll be moral degeneration within the country. Uh, there will be increasing opposition and anger and hostility among populations outside the country. You may continue to get support from dictatorships and from uh, you know the U.S. Uh, administration, but you're beginning to lose the populations, and that has a consequence. Uh, the you could predict, in fact, I and others did predict back in the 70s, that as, just to quote myself, those who are call themselves supporters of Israel are actually supporters of its moral degeneration international isolation, and very possibly ultimate destruction. That's what's, that's the course that's happening. It's not the only example in history. There are many analogies drawn to South Africa, most of them pretty dubious in my mind. But there's one analogy which I think is pretty realistic, which isn't discussed very much. It should be. In 1958, uh, the South African nationalist government, which was imposing the harsh apartheid regime, uh, recognized that they're becoming internationally isolated. Uh, we know from declassified documents that in 1958, the South African foreign minister called in the American ambassador. And we have the conversation. He essentially told him, uh, look, we're becoming a pariah state. Uh, we're losing all the, everyone's voting against us in the United Nations. We're becoming isolated. But it really doesn't matter, because you're the only voice that counts. And as long as you support us, it doesn't really matter what the world thinks. That wasn't a bad prediction. If you look at what happened over the years, opposition to South African apartheid grew and developed. Uh, there were, there was a UN arms embargo. Uh, uh, sanctions began, boycotts began. Uh, uh, it, uh, it was so extreme by the 1980s that even the U.S. Congress was passing sanctions, which uh, President Reagan had to veto. Uh, he was the last supporter of the apartheid regime. Uh, he, Congress actually pa uh, reinstated the sanctions over his veto, and he then violated them. As late as 1988, uh, Reagan, the last holdout, his administration declared the African National Congress, Mandela's African National Congress, to be one of the more notorious terrorist groups in the world. So the U.S. had to keep supporting South Africa, it was supporting terrorist, terrorist group uh, UNITA in Angola. Uh, finally, even the United States joined uh, the rest of the world. and. Uh, very quickly the apartheid regime collapsed. Now that's not fully analogous to the Israel case by any means. Now, there were other reasons for the collapse of apartheid, two crucial reasons. One of them was that there was a, a, a settlement that was acceptable to South African and international business, simple settlement keep the socioeconomic system and allow, put it metaphorically, allow black, some black faces in the limousines. Uh, that's, that was the settlement, and that's pretty much what's been implemented, not totally. There's no comparable settlement in Israel-Palestine. But a crucial element, not discussed here, is Cuba. Uh, Cuba sent military forces and, and tens of thousands of the technical workers, the doctors and the teachers and others, uh, and they drove the South African aggressors out of Angola, and they compelled them to abandon illegally held Namibia. And more than that, as in fact Nelson Mandela pointed out as soon as he got out of prison, uh, the Cuban soldiers, who incidentally were black soldiers, uh, shattered the myth of uh, invincibility of the white supermen, that had a very significant effect on both black Africa and uh, uh, the white South Africa. It indicated to the South African government and population that they're not going to be able to impose their hope of a regional support system, at least quiet system, that would allow them to pursue the 
of their operations. Uh, land with me and walk 